It is my distinct honor to present to you our next speaker. This has uh, been a long time coming, and I was very excited that we were able to make this work. The gentleman seated to my right is Mr. Brian O'Shea. He's worked over 20 years in the intelligence and counterintelligence world, and he's worked across multiple intelligence agencies, whether it be for the US intelligence, special operations, private competitive intelligence firms, corporate litigation, investigative firms, and several gray boutique intelligence firms. He can tell you more about that later. Currently, he's the CEO of Stryker Pierce Investigations, very interesting company. It provides private citizens with counter-stalking, counter-surveillance, private investigations, and missing persons services, both in the United States and abroad. He's also the managing director of the Thane Andrus Group. It specializes in providing corporate clients, law firms, nonprofit organizations, and private organizations around the world with services such as the counter competitive intelligence, the counter corporate subversion, internal corporate investigations, and whenever any other organization has been attacked from the outside. We haven't really had a speaker like this at an ESFLC event before, so fairly interesting for us to have. He's also the, the founder. He also uh, is the founder of a nonprofit organization called the ILA Foundation, and it provides investigations counter-stalking services and counter-harassment services to survivors or potential victims of campus rape, sexual assault, and stalking through direct involvement uh, through any type of organizations. And they do workshops, uh, they do a lot of empowerment, and they really have done a great job in attempting to, to give a kind of ammunition to people who have been in bad situations and ways to improve them. He's had many clients, Fortune 500 CEOs, Saudi princes, plenty of lawyers. I think he was on a lawyer call for a bit. It kept him a bit busy. He wasn't able to join us here <laughs> until right before. And he's spoken about all of these issues and his work in many fora. Uh, we met at the Oslo Freedom Forum, the premier gathering for human rights supporters in the world. He's given workshops there, other speeches there. He's been present at all the large security conferences around the world, giving his advice, trying to meet potential clients, and to use his services. He's advised many people, including the, the author Naomi Wolf, former presidential candidate James Gilmore, two Saudi princes, and he even jumped out of the plane with the current King of Jordan many years ago. Did not know that. Very interesting. So he was featured in the best-selling book, You Can't Lie to Me, and he plays a stalker slash assassin in the soon-to-be-released movie Blind with such stars as Alec Baldwin, Demi Moore, and Dylan McDermott. He's a master manipulator of the truth, understands where people are being led astray, and provides those services so that people can be helped, and people do have protection against those who do seek harm. He is the embodiment of all the principles of entrepreneurship and the ideas of liberty that we try to talk about and get people excited about across the continent. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. Brian O'Shea. Well, that's a lot to live up to. Um... I don't think he was a king at the time. By the way, I'm the worst spy ever. It took me about an hour to find my wallet and my tie this morning. I think the maid took them, so. Um, I am here to talk to you today about um, detecting surveillance, countering surveillance, and using those same skills to learn who's surveilling you. Now, why is this important? Well, we'll get to that in a second, but first I think it's important that we define what is surveillance. Okay, according to my quick research in the Webster's Dictionary, um, basically it comes from the word to watch over, to gather, you know, to watch someone, to surveil, to, to show vigilance. Now, the way the UK defines it is observation or looking at a person to see if they're going to commit a crime. I think that's a bit limited. The way we define it at the different organizations I work with 
is to watch over someone, to surveil someone, and to collect intelligence on them. Now, who conducts surveillance? Is it governments? Is it organizations? Is it nonprofits? Is it stalkers? Is it this guy? That's actually Yael, but. Is it this guy? <laughs> Possibly. Perhaps it's these people. Well, that's the right answer right there, everyone conduct surveillance. Everyone in this room at some point has conducted some sort of surveillance. Think about when you were that five-year-old kid. You really wanted that cookie. Now your mom or your dad already told you that you couldn't have one. So what did you do? You peeked around the corner. You waited till mom or dad was out of the room. You collected intelligence. You did a risk assessment. You waited till they left. You assessed the situation and you moved in for the kill and you got that cookie. Now, if you didn't do good intelligence, you probably got caught and got in a lot of trouble. But the point is, everyone conducts surveillance or has the capacity to. Now, is that bad? No. Surveillance is important. You should always be watching the people around you. You should always be assessing your environment, your competitors, uh, people that simply don't like you. And the reason why it's important to lay out that everyone conducts surveillance is because so many times in history, we never saw it coming. We never realized when there were, for lack of a better term, spies in our midst. Who remembers this case? Okay. A group of alleged spies in the United States for decades, for decades, okay, collecting, doing agent provocateur type stuff. I'm not really sure what the outcome of what they did was, and we may never know, but that's a great example of the fact that if you look left and you look right, and I'm not trying to subvert or tear you guys apart, but you just never know. And the worst thing about what I like to call nefarious surveillance or nefarious espionage is a lot of times the people conducting intelligence collection or surveillance don't even realize who they're doing it for or why they're doing it. And we'll get to that a little later. So yes, everyone can be a spy. Now you see the list, we already went over it. Everyone, especially since Edward Snowden, is convinced that the government is spying on them. And yeah, they probably are. They're collecting on you at a minimum. I don't think they have the manpower to actually go through 8 billion phone calls with 39,000 employees, but they're definitely collecting. It came out, I mean, it's undeniable. But where people forget is that a lot of times, it's not the government. A lot of times, it can be criminal organizations. It can be stalkers. That's actually the number one purveyors of surveillance around the world, is stalkers. People who want to do you ill intent either through uh, psychosis or jealousy, which could also be psychosis, or for any other reason. But another main reason that people do collection and surveillance is for competitors. Okay, now we've all seen the movies like Duplicity. Um, anyone watched the new show Billions? They're always spying on each other on that show. Okay. And so what that shows is that it's everywhere. And at Stryker Pierce, you know, look, what Edward Snowden did was good for the world. He got it out there. Um, they shouldn't be doing that. I, I totally agree with that. But yeah, I got a problem with Edward Snowden. I'll tell you why because my phone has been ringing off the hook since those revelations came out and everyone and their sister and brother calls me and they're like, um, the CIA is spying on me. I said, okay, what do you do? Well, I macrame shorts at home down in Georgia. So, okay, why do you think the CIA is spying on you? Well, I have a Twitter profile and I speak my mind. So what ends up happening is normally a stalker, an ex-husband in those cases, and the funniest thing about those calls, or when I have those meetings, is when you tell someone that it's not the CIA, or not the NSA, or GCHQ, or MI5, whoever, they always look disappointed, like, hmm. And then I have to tell them too, then I become life coach, and I say, but you're still important, I mean, someone's stalking you. 
So why is it conducted? Why do people conduct surveillance? Seems kind of skullduggery. I, feel, I felt a little bad last night listening to the keynote when uh, you know, speakers talking about how you shouldn't lie and you shouldn't sneak around, and I'm like, eesh, that's what I do for a living. But that's okay, because what we're doing is we're trying to stop the people that are using those same nefarious skill sets to take away civil liberties, to take away you know, your sense of safety, your sense of worth, uh, to take away your profit. And some people really do just do it for fun. Uh, when I was a kid, we used to go on what we called missions. We'd spy on the neighbors. In today's day and age, I realize it's actually called breaking and entering, but hey, who knew? But again, the reasons for surveillance and the reason for espionage are not as important as understanding how to detect it and how to defend against it. And then you can backpedal and figure out why they're doing it, which is part of everything that I'm going to try to present to you. Now, also keep in mind, too, I'm not here to teach you anything. Everything I'm about to tell you, except for maybe some facts and figures, you already know. You were the kid in the kitchen with the cookie. You've spied on someone. Okay? Don't look innocent, you all have. Okay, some way, shape, or form. You asked, hey, how'd you do on the test? That's collection. Uh, did you get into the school? That's collection. You want to find out your chances of getting into a certain school. So, and that's okay. Okay, but the key thing is understanding what it is, what it looks like, when it is organized, and when it is nefarious. Now, here's the scariest thing I learned in my career. If it's the government spying on you, depending on the government, caveat, but if it's the US government or some of what they call you know, the, the five eyes, that's less worrisome to me as a, a service provider of counterintelligence and counter surveillance than if it's a stalker, than if it's a criminal. But one of the main things we see is competitive intelligence collection. Now, who's ever heard of competitive intelligence? Okay, this is one of the fastest growing industries in the information market. Now, let me just put this up front. Um, I'm not going to talk much about cyber. Everyone last night at the cocktail reception hour was like, tell me about cyber, tell me about Snowden. I I'm not that smart. I took on the term social hacking so I could have hacking in the title. I don't really know what it is. We used to call it manipulation. But the key thing is, what we see is traditional surveillance techniques being used to gain information on competitors. Now, they're doing this for many reasons. To get an edge on the competition, of course. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing actually wrong with legal competitive intelligence. The type of competitive intelligence and collection that I'm talking about today is stuff that falls outside of the norms of the law, of what's considered moral, and what's considered ethical. Now, those can vary group to group, country to country. But you know what's right, and you know what's wrong. If you have to pick a lock and hack a computer to get someone's secrets, if you don't think that's wrong, probably should be locked up. But the key thing is that you know what's right, you know what's wrong. So looking at Google, getting company business reports, there is nothing wrong with that, and you should do that. Um, and it, when I say competitive intelligence, I don't want you to tune out, because you're probably thinking corporations, big businesses, Saudi princes. But it's also one of the biggest clients of competitive intelligence is nonprofits. We actually had a retirement agency come to us and they said, hey, our competition has hired some people to spy on us and they're actually getting stuff. We don't know how they're doing it. We've had a donut company come to us with the same complaints. We've had a waffle company. We've, <laughs> we actually had a dog walking service in DC come to us and he's like, hey, someone's stealing all my clients. Now, amazingly, in D.C., it's actually a multi-million dollar industry to walk dogs. I may be in the wrong business. But the point is, no one is immune to it. One of the main things I hear from almost every potential client, they say, well, why would they want to spy on me? Well, you don't know why. You know, you'll never know why. A lot of people say, well, my company's not public. Why would they care? Everything's out there about me. Why would they care? You don't know the reasons. The reasons could be to turn you against your organization. The reasons could be to find out who's the most important person in your organization and hire them away, thus breaking apart your leadership structure. You just don't know, and it's all important. Now, 
What's even scarier about this industry, and let me just drop that word. I actually don't find it scary at all because once you learn about it, and hopefully a little bit by the end of this presentation, if it is something that's scary to you, you won't be as scared of it. Because at the end of the day, for a lot of people, it's just a job. It's very rare, as a matter of fact, I have never in 20 years come across anyone who is twisting their mustache and adjusting their monocle and petting their hairless cat, saying, I can't wait to spy on someone. No, they were normally getting paid, they were on a contract, there's a statement of work, there's very described deliverables. Again, this is a business. People have to pay mortgages. People have to send their kids to school. I have so many clients that will come to me and say, it's the CIA, and I'm like, no, it's not. And they say, well, what if they're going rogue? And I'm like, well, at $85,000 a year in the DC Beltway where mortgages are about a million dollars, I don't think they're spending their time just for fun spying on you. And so that's one thing to keep in mind. We had a lot of discussions last night about why people do things. And it really just comes down to a return on investment. You have something that someone else wants and is going to profit them either monetarily, either in terms of uh, popularity, or in terms of reputation. Okay, but there's always a return on investment. If you think someone's spying on you, always try to figure out, okay, what do I have? What assets do I have that someone would want? Doesn't mean they're not spying on you if you can't figure that out. That just means that you don't know the reason and that's why it's important to start detecting it and start learning what they're doing and how they do it so you can figure that out. Now, one thing I've noticed, and I'm working on a book to this effect, it's competitive intelligence attracts all of the ex, well, so many of the ex-intelligence officers from around the world. And think about it, you've been, an intelligence analyst or a collector or a human intelligence collector, all of these things that people normally call spies. So what are you going to do when your clearance gets shut off, when you get kicked out of your country? Well, you Google a job and guess what comes up? Competitive intelligence. Here's some examples that I pulled from a previous talk that I gave. These are actual headlines, okay? Wall Street Journal, we are all spies now. This former CIA director said that. ABC News, a uh, Manhattan investment banker caught working for the Russian government. Um, Buenos Aires, the biggest reform challenge is unemployed spies. Um, and the rest goes on. Don't, don't look at the Epoch Times one. That, that's about me. It wasn't, wasn't very good. Um, but when you look at these things, you're like, wow, what are these people going to do? They have, they have mortgages. They have student loans. They need to make money. They have a skill set. There's someone out there willing to hire them. Now, it's not as shady as I, I'd like it to be in terms of fiction. The way it works normally is a client will hire their general counsel or their law firm. And then what happens is the general counsel will reach out to a large consulting firm. Okay, it could be any one of them. You know those consulting firms that say management and strategic solutions? they will then turn around and reach out to an actual competitive intelligence firm. And you can actually go to skip.org, S-C-I-P dot O-R-G. There's a whole list of uh, competitive intelligence firms. And again, I'm not saying they're doing anything illegal, but then what happens is you get to these smaller groups that really need to impress the lawyer. They really need to impress their client. And a lot of times those statements of work are so ambiguous, just get the information and they get the information. A lot of clients will even have them sign something called a master services agreement that says you will not break the law, you will not violate our ethical values. And the person at the very end of that chain says, you got it, no problem. But they do, a lot of them do it anyways. Just this morning I pulled this off Simply Hired. Can everyone see that? Look at the very top part that's highlighted. Okay, that's just one website. One website, it's one, again, it is one of the fastest growing industries in the world. Ironically, uh, these two gentlemen named Gilad and Fold um, were former Mossad, and they pretty much started the competitive intelligence industry. They uh, established a competitive intelligence academy in Cam Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. They came from the intelligence background, and with that flowed the entire influx of people who want to get into this work. And again, I have to underline this. The majority of them are not nefarious, they're not criminals, they're not bad, but it's that small percentage that do the most damage, 
and really, really can mess things up both in business, in nonprofits, in any organization. So why should you care? Okay? You should care because even if you're just a student, even if you're just a nonprofit, even if you're a church, yes, we've had church clients, as sad as that is. A lot of times it's not just about profit, like I said earlier. A lot of times it's about taking apart the leadership, creating doubt in an organization. Uh, someone may want this, uh, this crowd next year. They may go after the reputation of this organization. This all falls into it. Um, it can destroy profits, and plain and simple. Some of the larger firms that don't really care how competitive intelligence is performed will actually get price pages and figure out what a smaller competitor is going to display at a trade show so they can scoop them so they could get in front of them and just wipe out whatever lo little profits they had, and then they gobble up the company. Sometimes they collect competitive intelligence to mess up a merger and an acquisition. Something that's supposed to be confidential, it gets collected, they put it out to the media, and now the entire deal is canned. So again, you just never really know the reason why. And sometimes, actually I'll get to that because that's one of my case studies, but sometimes it's so bizarre you cannot realize it. Uh, and if anyone ever wants to give me a call and listen to some funny stories, I mean, some of the calls we get and some of the cases we worked, they'd blow your mind. I mean, they're just so crazy. It can also get you arrested, it can get you fired, it can get you killed. And the reason why is because if someone comes up to you, let's say you start at your new job, you start at your new law firm, where there's these firms called expert network firms, have you heard of these? So what they do is um, they will call you up, they'll find your resume, and they'll say, hey, you are an expert underwater basket weaver. We have a client that wants to learn more about that industry. Would you be willing to consult over the phone for about $300 an hour, just in your free time? And that's what an net expert network firm is. Well, what happens then is you're led to give out information about your company. Sometimes you don't realize it because you're making good money. And they say, hey, I want to set up a project on how to do this, this, and this. Can you tell me what that looks like without revealing anything confidential? You start talking, you start talking, and if they're really doing their job correctly, albeit morally dubiously, you're going to start actually talking about the stuff you are working on and not even realize it. And then you turn around and, you know, the police could be showing up at your cubicle or your office. That's what we call an unwitting spy versus a witting spy. Um, it can get you fired, obviously. Um, and then it can get you killed. Uh, I was once doing competitive intelligence uh, in a favela south of Sao Paulo, and I had a tape recorder in my pocket. Well, my meeting got canceled, but in walked these really large men. It was a construction firm. Again, I'm not the best when it comes to judgment. And I walk in, and I'm sitting there going, oh, this is really bad, and they're interrogating us. They're like, why do you want to know this information? Why are you here? That was around the point in my career I realized, nah, I need to get on the other side of this. This is not cool. And here I have this blinking light in my pocket as I'm trying to cover it with my handkerchief, and they have a bunch of excavators out back and a dog on a rope. And I'm like, yeah, this, this can get me killed. Now, that's an extreme situation, but you just never know. It depends on the country you're in, or if you inadvertently are revealing things about your boss, your company, you don't realize your company may be involved in something yeah, a bit illegal, you know, that can get you killed too. Very rare of it. So here are a couple cases I just want to quickly go over that we have recently worked on. Now the first one is called the Red Queen. Now the reason why they have these funny names is because we actually just assign a name to a case to help us remember it, but also to kind of hide the identity of the client. Now in the case of the Red Queen, this was one of those the CIA is spying on me, they're messing up my career, I can't get a job, someone inserted 400 criminal charges in my county records, and of course I'm looking at him going, okay, here's another one, Edward Snowden, thank you. But as it turned out, he was right. Now it wasn't the government per se, it was his ex-wife who was very high up in the government very attractive and very influential, getting people to kind of harass her ex-husband as she moved 
organization to organization. And as I looked at it, I said, huh. I said, well, you're not wrong. I said, but this is not exactly a government operation. It's just using the government tools. Now, we were able to solve that case, and she got fired and is currently facing some problems of her own. But that's a, that's a great example. We called, I just love the title, The Red Queen, because that was just really nasty stuff she was doing to this poor guy. And she did, in fact, get someone in a police department to insert paper charges into his file. And what happens in the US is you start with a file that's paper, the police report. Once they do the audit, the audit just means matching up the paper files to the online files. It becomes part of your permanent record. And then you have to work like hell to get it out of there. That's what she was doing to him. Messed up his clearance and everything. The guy could not get a job. He's doing better now, but we're still trying to help him find a job. Another one, and I have this article, is actually in a Canadian magazine um, that I wrote for a, a conference I did. The Tale of Two Insiders. Now, this is exactly how nefarious competitive intelligence firms will work. In this case here, you had two people. He had one disgruntled employee, Okay, and then you had one employee that was just overzealous. So this firm swooped in on these employees. How'd they find them? LinkedIn. They just looked for anyone that kept updating their profile and putting a lot of stuff out there about themselves every time this person sneezed. And then another guy was putting on his LinkedIn, just finished a project in Ontario. The new factory is almost built. Well, that was pretty easy deliverable right there. So what they ended up doing with one of them was they called one as a recruiter. They said, hey, love your resume. And he told them everything, thinking he's getting a job. The other one, they just kept meeting her on planes. They happened to have people everywhere who were, wow, just what do you do for a living? She's like, oh, you know, not too much. And they're like, wow, that's fascinating. I have never met anyone that does that. And just gave her an audience. And she's talking, talking, talking. Um, and, you know, that's how they did this. And so they got insiders, both of them unwitting, who just took that company apart. And that became a major case. And then the other one happened to me. Now, this is real spy versus spy stuff. I had a law firm come to me. And they said, hey, we have a problem. This firm from another country is spying on our intelligence guy, their competitive intelligence guy, trying to lure him to a meeting to get him discredited, thus taking him off the case, which would wipe out our key witness. So they hired me to do counterintelligence on this company that was spying on him, and it was hilarious. And it was real amateur hour, too, because they were dog walkers on their van. I'd just done a dog walking job, so I kind of knew every dog walker in the DC area, and they'd even take the time to put up a website. And so everywhere I went, there was the dog walking van. And I was thinking they either have a really great business that just happens to be where all the dogs are near me, or these are the guys. Then it was just a question of getting them off the scent. So I would, I would do things like say, hey, I'm going to go to this embassy or that embassy, and then I'm going to go to Brooklyn to go meet with that guy. And I'm just dropping my itinerary behind. And they followed it around. Finally, what we did is we just called them up. We acted like a, we set up our own company, and we said, uh, hi, you, you do competitive intelligence? He's like, yeah, we do. And I was like, where are you located? He's like, New York. He's like, what's your problem? I said, oh, I'm really scared. I, I don't even know if this stuff exists. It's spies and everything. And I just gave him an audience, and he would not shut up, and he did himself in. He was just going on and on and on about every single case. He even sent me documents where I could see the whiteout over the confidential at the top and the bottom. Um, and that's, you know, and that's a case too. But the point of all those cases is to kind of show you how espionage and collection transcends all the different industries, all sorts of different lifestyles, and it really is everywhere. So, what I'm sure most people came here for is, how do you do it? How do you, how do you evade surveillance? How do you evade collection? Okay. Well, the first thing you have to do is you, you kind of have to learn how the spies do it. Okay, so they do a number of things. First, we're going to, actually, I'm going to go to the next slide and get back to this one. Okay, so how they do it is, the first thing they do is, if you jump down, is the first thing you want to do is learn how to detect physical surveillance. Now, yes, this really happens. Actually, New York, according to some statistics, 
has the most spies in the world from not only different countries, but different industries. I mean, literally, if you come from, if you come from this conference and you went to New York, especially if you're hanging out with Yael, just kidding, um, but if you went to New York this weekend, when I go to New York, when I go back to New York this weekend, I guarantee I'll have someone knocking on my door saying, hey, I'm doing a background check on your neighbor. Well, they're not. They're actually trying to figure out what I'm doing at this conference. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is learn how to detect physical surveillance. Now, the easiest way to do this is called a surveillance detection route. And everything I'm telling you is not confidential. You can actually look most of this stuff up. It used to be. But a surveillance detection route is really easy, and it's a very good skill to have simply because it can save your life if you have a stalker, if you have a potential rapist, anything like that. And I don't have a diagram for this, and it's a longer class, but in a nutshell, what you're doing, whether you're driving a car or whether you're walking, is you're taking people on a stair-step looking route to get to your objective. So if you're walking from across town to get here, you want to map out your route and take yourself through as many intersections as you can. So you get to the first intersection, you look left, you look right, you cross the street, you turn right, okay, as you're walking, you can actually look left and right. You take a left, you take a right, you keep doing this at every single thing. What you're looking for is the same people who are taking you on that route. Now, if it's organized surveillance, it'll usually be two to three people, sometimes five. Every third turn, typically, they have to change who's called the eye. Who's ever heard of that term from spy movies and I'm the eye? All the eye is, that is the person who's got their eyes on the target. They're in radio communication with their team. The rest of the team is on alternate streets. So if you keep forcing them to make these turns, they have to rotate the eye, okay? And what you're looking for is that same guy you initially spotted to be back behind you maybe seven blocks later. Now what you've done is you've collected against them. You know the size of their team, you know who's on their team, you know what they look like, and you know you're definitely being surveilled. Now, if you're heading to a meeting with a source, or a journalist, or a business meeting, if you do detect surveillance, don't go to the meeting. Okay? If you detect surveillance and you decide not to go to the meeting, what you don't want to do is pick up your phone and go, I can't go to the meeting, and then hurry off, because now you've just confirmed it. A lot of times, surveillance is just trying to figure out if you're up to something. So you just want to be cool. And then the next thing you want to do, too, is burn their budget. Everyone's getting paid. Most surveillance is conducted by private uh, detectives in most countries. It's usually subcontracted out because it's expensive. And they're getting paid hourly. I pick up surveillance all the time because the opposing party doesn't know who I am, so they think I'm the guy who's, you know, with the wife or something like that. They think I'm the cheater or something. And when I pick it up, I actually took a guy to the ocean I stared at the ocean contemplatively for about three hours. Then I went to Medieval Times. I cheered for the Black Knight for about three hours. And all I was doing was burning up the budget. And, you just, and that's a way of making yourself a hard target as well once you spot the surveillance. Okay. The other thing you want to do is learn how to read body language. And not only body language of individuals, but body language of crowds. Okay. So who's ever read any books on body language reading? Okay, who knows what a baseline is? Okay, what a baseline is, is that is the normal body language behavior of your target, okay? So what happens with the baseline is the way you establish someone's baseline is simple. When you meet them, you say, how was your day? Did you eat breakfast? That sort of thing, okay? Once you get to that point, you're watching, and it's easy to remember head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Just start at the head and just watch the way they look. Now, does this indicate deception? No. It could be their normal baseline behavior. What you want to do is just get a sense of what their normal baseline behavior is. And then, once you ask the hard questions, did you steal the stapler? What you're looking for is anything that's a change in that pattern. Most of the time, subconsciously, it's turning feet away or covering vital organs. Okay, that's a natural, you know, like men will adjust their watch. What they're doing is they're covering their heart. Women will always play with the necklace or their neck. That's called a pacifying behavior, okay? Because they're massaging their neck because you just asked them something stressful and they stressed out a little. Men do this too, they adjust their tie, okay? Pay attention to that too because it's a good way to tell if that date is gonna go anywhere. If they're doing a lot of this, you, you might as well get the check and skip dessert because it's not gonna happen, 
Okay, so see, all sorts of uses. Um, but that's, you wanna learn to, now the reason why you wanna learn to do that is because it's easy to detect people when you walk by them on the street. You'll actually see their body language change if, they have, if they're causing you ill intent. I've actually seen a guy's watching me. So I turned right around, walked right by him, and he went like this. I mean, yeah. And now baselining crowds. Now this is most important because this, this is where you can save your life as well. If you're in a really bad country, it's a great way to detect if some like riot's gonna happen or anything. What you wanna do is you wanna watch everywhere you go. Now if you do this every day and you make this a practice, you'll just do it naturally. But for instance, when you're walking down the city street, what do you see? You see tourists. You see tours. Okay, you see people. Everyone is going somewhere. But you always know when someone's going to try to ask you for money or try to rob you. Why? Because they loiter. They're breaking the baseline of the crowd. Everyone else is going somewhere. Someone's staring at you. You just want to become aware of that. You're in an elevator. What do you do? Ask them what floor. How's your day going? That's natural. If someone starts asking you, how's your day going? Oh, do you live in this building? How long have you lived here? Get off the elevator and take the stairs and make a note of who that person is. So everywhere you go, you want to be baselining behavior. If you're at the cocktail hour tonight and someone's like the whole time through the crowd, that's not normal. They either really, really like you and are gonna ask you out on a date where you can massage your neck, or you know they may wanna do something bad to you, you just don't know, or they may just be weird, but you have to assess that, okay? And then the other thing is, once you get to that point where, both with the body language, the physical surveillance, you have now detected espionage, you've detected collection. Now the next thing you wanna do is learn as much about that person as you can. Now, don't try this at home, but we, we've actually put GPS taggers on people's cars who were following us so we could figure out who they worked for. And then once we figured it out, we found GPS taggers on our own cars, which I then put on dump trucks and you know, semi-trailer trucks that are heading five states away, you know, run up that budget. I don't know if they actually went that far, but a lot of them did. Okay, so you've detected it. Now the other thing, and we talked about this last night, let's talk a little bit about cyber. Everyone says, well, what about cyber? Yeah, you gotta worry about it, but Let's face the facts. I mean, these things are being hacked and exploited so quickly. It, can you really protect that much information? I mean, you really can. So the key thing with that I, and, you know, do what you want, what I tell people, and I told someone this last night, the best thing you could do is, as long as it's not damaging to yourself, put as much stuff out there about yourself as you can. Really make them work for it. You know, just list, you go to my LinkedIn profile, oh my God, my entire biography is on there. Someone's not getting paid for my information because I've already put it out there for free. But what you're also doing too is by always putting things out. Now, caveat to this, don't put out, hey, the combination to my ATM card is this, this, this. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I am talking about is tweet every time you sneeze. Okay, post a link every time your boss says, good job. Because someone has to collect on that and someone eventually has to go to their boss and say, hey, I spent the last six months, I've got 200 pages of intelligence and they sneezed and they got an attaboy from the boss. If you create a haystack, it's easier to hide needles. People that don't have a social media footprint, they're susceptible to two things. Reputation attack, because if you're not talking about yourself, someone can control that conversation or even spoof you. Or, the minute you put something out on social media, it's gonna be important someone's gonna follow it. So that's just my, just to answer that question because I know I was gonna get asked that. So I always say if it's not harmful to you, have a, as big of a footprint as you can. And then the other thing too with that, red herrings. Who knows what a red herring is? Okay, red herring is misinformation. Throw it out there. Make it seem plausible. Don't say, hey, I learned to fly today with wings. Uh, but what you want to say is, hey, I'm looking at this other job, and then the next day say, nah, it didn't work out. Well, now someone, if they are collecting on you, they've got to follow that lead. Now they've got to figure out what the job was. Budgets are going up. Someone's getting fired. That means someone's not going to be spying on you for long because they're doing a bad job. So why is it important? Uh, you know what? Sorry, guys. Okay. Back to that slide. Information elicitation. 
This is the key way surveillance and information elicitation is conducted. This is how spies do it. This is how they're trained, whether in competitive intelligence or the government, this is how they do it. Watch investigative reporters and watch the way they ask questions. Okay? The first technique is called the hourglass technique. Okay, the hourglass technique, and I'm sure you've all seen this, goes like this. The piece of information you want is right at the center of that hourglass. Human nature tells us that you always remember the beginning and the end of a conversation, never the middle. So what you do is you start up here, and I'm telling you to think this way because this is how it's done. Someone will come up to you and they'll say, hey, you go to Charles University, that's really great. I've always wanted to be a law student. Why did you choose that one? Well, that's, you got no problem saying that. So you start talking. They're doing two things. They're hourglassing, they're getting you comfortable, and they're socially engineering you to give them information, albeit at that point, you know, nothing really needle, needle moving. Okay, and then it starts going in a little more. Yeah, so um, you study law? Yeah, it's a law school. Oh, really? You don't look like the lawyer type to me. Well, I do, and actually I'm a good lawyer. My dad's a lawyer. Well, now they're collecting more information. And the key piece of information they want may be who sits next to you in that class, how many people are in that class. They're gonna get to that, and then they're gonna come out and say, oh, by the way, do you know a good restaurant around here? You know, what's the best flight out of here? What's the weather gonna do tomorrow? By the end of that, you have no way of knowing which information they were after because they hourglassed it. And in hourglassing it, they also just baseline do. They also figured out your baseline pattern and body language. This is the number one way of collecting intelligence in a non-cyber way, is information elicitation. The other one's a recruiter technique. How many people have received a phone call from a recruiter, it went really, really well, you talked for an hour, you went home, you were like, hey, you know what, I am getting this job. That guy talked to me for like an hour and then never heard back again. That is one of the most common techniques in collecting information because what happens is when you post your resume online, people, we used to actually look to see who recently updated resumes. And anyone that updated it in the last week, that's our number one target. And then we also looked for areas where people didn't make a lot of money. And so they'd call, now I never did this, this is one of the reasons I left this firm that I was at because when I saw that happening I thought it was absolutely disgusting. Um, but that's what they do. And so they get the guy talking, they start with the job furthest back, why do you go to that school? What they're after is the project that person was working on. So they say, so this current job, why, why are you leaving it or why did you leave? Well, this, this and this, really. So you're a program manager, I mean, what's that look like in your industry? And they start describing it. And what they're doing is they're basically re-engineering or reverse engineering the project management structure of that target, and then with a little more secondary, a couple more sources, a couple more recruitment calls, they put together what the competitor's working on because they were told by the people that worked on it. And then they never call that person again. Okay, and that's a technique you have to look out for. If a recruiter calls you, never take the call on the spot. Just say, well, now's not a good time for me, but can I get your number and we can schedule something? Check them out. Not just on LinkedIn, not just on Google. Check them out, check out the physical address of their office. I have so many clients that come to me and they're like, hey, we're about to invest $20 million in you know, the unicorn fund. And I'm like, oh great, give me the information. I check it out, there's not even an office, it's an empty lot. I'm like, did you, really? But it happens all the time. So check it out, make them give you information, take control of it. Planes, trains, and automobiles. What is going on on planes, trains, and automobiles? People seem to think that they're in a secure facility when they're traveling. It blows my mind. How many people have seen on a plane like some lawyer working on a document that says confidential? And it's like, eh. You know, and we've done penetration tests uh, where we spy on the company for the company to show vulnerabilities. I've been behind a lead counsel with my phone on a plane. Just great, I know the whole strategy, okay? Automobiles, one of the number one things that people bug is automobiles, why? Because texting and driving is illegal, okay? And it's easy, it's a lot easier than hacking. You buy yourself a little recording device, you throw it under the seat, it records for 72 hours, you retrieve it, okay? And you've got everything. Because people get in their car and they talk, they think they're in a secure facility, it's not secure, nothing's secure, okay? And then, of course, trains blow my mind. Trains are the best. 
I travel to New York to DC every week. And it just, I mean, that is an SP, that is a spy's dream as the Amtrak that runs between New York and DC. Because who's on the train? Politicians, uh, lawyers, um, people in the intelligence community. And those are my favorite, by the way. I love asking them, hey, what do you do? And they go, well, I can't tell you. I'm like, well, now you don't have to. Um, but that's the thing is, trains are the worst and people just talk. And I don't know if it's a sense of self-importance or the train's too loud, but a guy just two days ago when I was going up to JFK to catch the flight out here, he's talking about his entire defense strategy so loud that people were leaving the car because he was so annoying. I wasn't leaving the car. I was trying to figure out who he worked for so I could get a new client. <laughs> he laid out the whole strategy. I finally took pity and I said, hey, here's my card. I socially hack people for a living. If I knew who the plaintiffs were, your case would be dead in the water. And he's like, well, who are you? And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not here to hurt. I'm just saying, shut up. You know, stop talking. You're, you're not doing your client a service. Again, planes, trains, automobiles, you are not safe in them. Information is information. Those are the easiest places to collect. And finally, the superstar technique. Every single penetration test I've done, I've been able to get information because you play on people's egos. And just so we're clear, you guys know what a penetration test is, right? You know, you're spying on your client at their request to detect vulnerabilities. And so I waited and I started getting the guy talking. And I'm not proud of this, but I gotta say a lot of those techniques that Neil Strauss, the guy that wrote the game, whether you're a man or a woman, they do kind of work. And so this one guy sitting next to me, now to be honest, we knew his itinerary and we were able to get inside his United Airlines account and get me seated right next to him. But I knew too that this guy had a real problem because he was always checking out his own LinkedIn profile. We could, you know, we could see him checking it out. And so we get on the plane, I'm like, hey, you know, so man, what a tough day. And uh, I ordered two whiskeys, but he didn't know that. And I said, oh, she brought me two by accident. Do you, do you want one? And he's like, yeah, sure, man, it's been a rough day. I said, oh, really? Tell me about that. And he's like, well, we just installed this big cybersecurity solution, blah, blah, blah. Make a long story short, this guy clearly had no audience at work. So I gave him the audience. And he told me everything. By the end of that flight, from LA to JFK, I knew every client at their data centers. I knew every algorithm problem they had. I knew who was getting fired. I knew who he was going to ask out on a date. I even knew the name of his dog. And of course, I keep a Rolodex of different dogs on my phone from Google. Because if you have a Labrador, I have a Labrador. Really? Yours name's Lucky, mine's not so lucky. But that's really cool. You know, we have a lot in common. OK? so. The superstar technique, if someone is really, really interested in what you do, and it's really not that exciting, or you don't think it is, or the topic's not that exciting, be aware of that. I mean, it's kind of like a humble pie experiment. No one's that interested in, you know, the way I write my name on a report. No one's that interested in my white paper about dog collars. So if someone shows an express amount of interest, always be wary. Now this kind of this kind of sucks because you guys are gonna walk out of here and go, like I said, I gave a good speech. What's he after? It's not that. This goes back to baselining. You have to look at everyone and you have to assess them, okay? And you know, and just get that in your head. And these things all work together because most people will play these techniques in unison. They do the hourglass. They do the flattery. Oh, they do the um, misinterpretation of what you do. So you're a law student, huh? Great, so how long have you been studying computer science? No, I'm a law student, I study this, this, and this. When you tell something, someone something wrong that they just told you, there's this human nature thing to correct you, and in correcting people, you give them more information. And then the best one is the dramatic pause. Who's ever seen this one? Actually, any future or current litigators here? Really? Okay, surprising. Um, one of the, Key techniques is just asking a question, they give you an answer, and you just stare at them. And people feel really uncomfortable with that silence. It works especially well on the phone because then they'll be like, hello, hello? Yeah, I'm listening, go ahead. I just told you. Mm. That's it? They're like, well, I mean, it's this, this, and this. 
Now, if you ever go to a competitive intelligence cocktail party, they're the most boring things in the world because people are just staring at each other. <laughs> okay. But that is one of the most common techniques. So remember, yeah, you know, you can trust your neighbor and everything. You guys have friends, you all work together. But if someone is putting these techniques together systematically, out of the blue, be wary of that. Okay, definitely be wary of that. And then, so why is it important to learn the ways of a spy? Well, the reason why is because you have a right to conduct your business or go to college or do what you want without people disrupting that in nefarious ways. Competition is good. I believe in competition because I think it lets the best people make it to the top. Competition is great because it brings out the best in everyone, sometimes the worst. When it brings out the worst, you have yourself espionage. Okay? So you, this stuff is important because you have a right to play on a fair battlefield. You have a right to conduct your business without someone stealing your stuff. They just need to make a better product or do a better service. And that's your right. Okay? You have the right to protect yourself. There's so many companies that press the cyber button. They say, hey, we got a cybersecurity solution. We don't have to do anything. Wrong. Okay, wrong. Because most of my clients come to me after they've invested that money and they say, hey, can you do a vulnerability assessment? Sure. I pick up my cell phone. One time I was playing Xbox while I was hacking a company. And I had my brother on Skype going, yeah, because he was listening to me. And that's the thing is, you know, you are responsible for your own security. Do not leave it in the hands of anyone else. If you're alone on the street, okay, your cyber solution isn't hovering above you, protecting you, okay? If you're not with your crowd, you are alone. You are responsible for it. No one else can do it for you. And then you also have the right to transparency. And by transparency, I'm saying if you employ techniques of counterintelligence, you have a right to know why people are doing this, and you have a right to know if people are breaking the law, because if they are breaking the law, report them. Go to their general counsel, sue them. Because if they're, if they're breaking the law, they're doing this kind of stuff, hey, you know what? They're not playing the game fairly. They need to be taken off, off the board. Okay, and you have the right to make them work for a living. You know what? Make yourselves harder targets. If someone's going to spy on you, make them work for it. You can't stop them all the time from spying on you, so. Once you detect them, or if you even think you're being spied on, make them work for it. Run up that budget. Make it take forever. Uh, I don't recommend medieval times for everyone. It gets kind of pricey. But again, really run up the budget. Make yourself a hard target. And that's what being a hard target is, is making yourself harder to spy on, harder to corner, and harder to attack. Is it wrong? No. Now, the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama is up there because a very good friend of mine, Dan Goldman, who wrote uh, emotional, uh, emotional Intelligence and the versions thereafter, he recently did a book with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and the Dalai Lama told him a story about this man in the woods and the elephants charging at him. And the guy gets trampled by the elephant, so the Dalai Lama comes up to him and he says, uh, why'd you get trampled by the elephant? He said, well, you told me to practice peace and turning the other cheek. He goes, well, I also told you to get out of the way. So that's why it's not wrong. Get out of the way. Make yourself harder targets. And finally, it's important because it's not going away. It's only increasing. So I always like to end my talk with this great quote from one of my favorite books. Because when you are among madmen, you've got to learn their ways so you can protect yourself from them. Okay, so that is my presentation of today. Go out, don't spy on each other, but detect people that are. Okay, keep your organizations and yourselves safe, so that way you can keep doing really, really great things and promoting liberty everywhere.